Shabbat Shalom, my Hebrews and Shalomi homies. If you're new to the channel and you're like WT Hockey Sticks, what does that mean? We read the Bible here uh, at least once a week. And today is that day. It is Shabbat. We keep the Sabbath on Saturday. And uh, we are starting a new book. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of old. It's a little old. Eensy teensy weensy bit old, but it's new to us in this study. Um, and that book is Leviticus, which is the Latin Vulgate third book. Leviticus meaning pertaining to the Levites, but actually the original name of this book was Waikra, or some such pronunciation, which is not to be confused with Warika, Oklahoma which is a place. This is Waikra, which means, and he called, capital H called, and he called, which, you know, it's never too early for a tangent. So here we go. Remember, remember that when somebody who's pretending that they know a thing or two about the Bible says, well, you know, brother, it takes the appropriate interpretation of the scripture in order to get the blah, 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 blah. You can remind them that, <laughs> you can remind them that Bereshit Genesis literally means in the beginning because that's the first few words in the book. And just like Waikra literally means and he called because that's the first few words in that book. And that's how all of these things are named. It is stupid practical. Especially when we get here into Leviticus, uh, which I'm looking forward to because there's some, at least in my particular whole Bible belief system, there's some things that are very applicable to our lives. And we have uh, a crow in a tree, but we also have Passover coming up and Easter coming up. And I'm just going to encourage you right now. If you're not sure about, well, what's Passover, what's Easter, uh, Yeshua Messiah kept Passover. He did not keep Easter. And in fact, we're told that Easter is an abomination. So, yeah, you should just Google that. Just, just look it up, okay? Um, there's also a great book called Come Out of Her, My People uh, that's put together by one of the guys who was instrumental in this, which is the ISR, the Institute for Scriptural Research. This is the scriptures, which is the book that I read out of each week. We might as well get it out of the way now. Why do you read that one? Let's play along. Who's playing along in the home game? Come on, let's do it. Number one, the reason that I use this book is because it's a direct translation from the original Hebrew source text to modern English. Okay, that's it. It's direct translation. It's not been stepped on a half a dozen times to fill an agenda or make somebody feel good about themselves. It's a direct translation. Number two, it preserves the names of the deity, meaning that instead of the Lord, King James Version, version capital, I have Yahweh or Yahuwah, okay, the name of the deity. And some people are uncomfortable saying that name. So you can fill in Adonai, uh, Hashem, uh, El Shaddai, um, whatever you prefer, okay? But it has the Hebrew Yahuwah or Yahweh in here. And it also has the name of Messiah, not as Jesus, which is a Romanization. There wasn't a Jesus of Nazareth. There was a Yehoshua, okay? Or Yeshua. And Yehoshua, Yeshua, depending on which pronunciation floats your boat, is the same name as Joshua, which is archetypical Old Testament, New Testament. Joshua means salvation. Joshua led people into the promised land, okay? Literally, Messiah's name means salvation. So instead of the Lord, all caps, and Jesus, uh, we have Yahweh, or Yahweh, and ya Yeshua, or Yehoshua, okay? So I love that. Because that was their names, man. Like that's, man. They they were Hebrew. Okay, that's a, like that's their name. Um, and then uh, you know it's like you can call somebody Bob your whole life, and if one day they remind you, hey, thanks, man, but my name's actually Tim. You might continue to call him Bob, but 
if you know their name's Tim, call them Tim. So, at least for me, he's spoken to my heart what his name is, and now I, I like to call him by that name, not the other. And then lastly, um, the New Testament in this book, because uh, it has both, is that when uh, Messiah or anybody else is teaching and preaching Old Testament, it's in bold, and it shows you the book, chapter, and verse, which is why I love it, because I get all the time, well, you realize that the Old Testament's for the Jews, right, and the New Testament's for the Christians? No. No. It doesn't work that way. No. And by the way, Messiah is for the Jews as well. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, what do I believe? I'm that one thin blank page in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm, I'm a whole Bible believer. Okay, I absolutely believe that Yeshua is Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, and I also believe that to the best of our ability, we are supposed to keep commandments because covenants stack, they don't replace each other. So, but uh, yeah, that's why I read the scriptures. Every, every week, somebody asks me that, so sorry if you've heard that a hundred times, which by the way, you can go back channel into our playlist and get into, uh, we started Genesis 1, and we just, if you're new to reading the Bible or you're struggling with a place to start reading, we literally started Genesis 1, in the beginning Elohim, in the beginning God, Yahweh, okay, and we've now worked our way through Genesis, through Exodus, and now we are in Warikra, or Leviticus, so one last announcement before I forget, been getting a lot of good questions about the Florida mission uh, for Hurricane Michael recovery as well as the uh, Nebraska floods mission. If you're interested in any of that, just go to Bear Independent, B E A R Independent.com, and um, there's a tab up top called Missions. You can click on that. The Florida mission profile and list of needs is there. I don't, I'm not begging you for money. If the spirit moves you, there's a way for you to donate there. I'm not asking you for your money. I'm not telling you I want your money. I'm not any of that. But people have been asking me, and it's now it just all lives on the website, so you can go look there. Um, I'll tell you point blank, we're not fully funded, and part of my daily prayers to the Father every morning is, Father, please fund the Florida mission. So there's that. Okay. Now, let's get into Huarikra, uh, which... I'm probably going to get an email from my Hebrew peeps who are like, good try, wrong, here's how you say it. Which is fine, you know, Pesach, check that out, yeah. And speaking of, again, the Passover versus, uh, versus Easter thing, Passover, Passover is definitely biblical, Easter is definitely not biblical. It's church, it's church doctrine, but it's not biblical. And that one... In the New Testament, there's one translation of the word Pesach instead of Passover into Easter. I think that was done on purpose. Because every other time in the book, it's translated as Passover, except for that one time it's translated into Easter. But if Easter is the celebration of Messiah's death and resurrection, which it's not, Easter comes from Ishtar, who was a pagan fertility goddess, which is why we have rabbits, because they're fertile, and eggs, because fertility, it's, it's pagan fertility worship, but it has nothing to do with Messiah. But how could he, when he was still alive with his own disciples, celebrate his own death and resurrection, resurrection before it happened? Well, I mean, he's the father He's God incarnate, so he can do whatever he wants. But logically, again, as far as having to jump through hoops to come to the particular interpretation of this passage of Scripture, brother, no, this is this thing's pretty straightforward. Warikra, and he called. Which literally, the first line here, Leviticus 1, and Yahweh called to Moshe, and he called. Warikra. And Yahweh called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of appointment, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Who's the children of Israel? Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to Yahweh, you bring your offering of the livestock of the herd or of the flock. If his, is, if his offering is an ascending offering of the herd, let him bring a male. A, my book says a perfect one. A lot of other translations say 
excuse me, burpee this morning, without blemish. So I think there's kind of a difference here, at least in my mind, between a perfect one and without blemish. But the basic tenet of, I will not give to Yahweh that which costs me nothing, right? Why would I bring a one without blemish? Well, these are sacrifices, right? And these are sacrifices, and lest anybody tell you that these were less than, this was a less than ideal system, because where did this come from? And Yahweh called to Moshe and spoke to him, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, so you're going to tell me that the father, this came directly from the father to Moshe, hey, do these things, this is how you do them, right? And now, listen, Yeshua is, Messiah is our sacrifice now, but Yeshua himself said repeatedly, until heaven and earth passes away. Okay, it's still here. Until heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle will, will pass away from this Torah, will be added to or taken away from this Torah. So, Guys, this is still in effect, okay? Yeshua is our sacrifice. He is our atoning sacrifice. However, I and the Father are one, says Messiah. These things still stand. If you love me, keep my commandments. These things still stand. We don't have a temple, which we will get to later in the book. But right now, right, like how do we go about doing these things? We don't have a temple. We will again. We will again. And who's going to be our high priest? Messiah. High priest in the order of Melchizedek. Who's Melchizedek? Melchizedek is from Genesis. He's the guy who blesses Abram, who delivers him the Torah. He then becomes Abraham and the patriarch of this entire belief system that we're all bought into anyway, right? So like, this, these things go full circle. And I believe Melchizedek was Yeshua Messiah indwelt in earth, on earth as a man. In his bodily form and elsewhere in this uh, Old Testament the Torah the Tanakh we see Messiah uh, made flesh or at least here dwelling amongst the people uh, repeatedly repeatedly he shows up all the time he's constantly instructing the patriarchs so all of that being said these things that the father is telling us to do we don't have a temple right now but you know, we don't even have a tent of appointment right now, but we will one day, okay? So, speak to the children of Israel when, uh, let it be a perfect one, let him bring it at the door of the tent of appointment for his acceptance before Yahweh. And so I have some visual aids. This week, I was doing some research uh, into Warikra, and I found this really cool blog uh, I'll give them a shout out called Messenger of the Name. Now, they're pretty tight with their stuff. They don't like you printing or copying or doing anything with that stuff. But listen, this is their stuff. This is Messenger of the Name. And this is a picture they had on their website, which is pretty archetypical of the tent of appointment. And so we just got done talking about them building all these things. The boss is tall. Again, if you want a Boss's Tall t-shirt, all that stuff's at barrendependent.com. Uh, and that is benefiting the Florida mission. The Boss is Tall. So over here, we have the tent of appointment. We have the curtains around the outside. We have the wash basin. We have the sacrificial um, altar. Like, this is a recreation of that. But I think it's pretty good re re recreation. Now, it's got electricity run to it. You know, I don't remember any, we just read Exodus and I don't, man, and then Yahweh spoke to Moshe and said, make sure that the disconnect is a three phase, 400 amp fused disconnect manufactured by uh, Cutler Bender or, or Cutler Hammer rather, and that the lugs of the disconnect shall be torqued to 46 foot pounds. And like, it's that's not in there. But you know, modern creature comforts, you gotta have electricity. Uh, so they got some electricity here, which is fun. And I'm guessing also that they didn't use all the silver or gold. What did we figure $39 million in precious metals in today's market? So anyway, you're gonna bring that animal to the door of the tent, okay. 
and he shall lay his hand on the head of the ascending offering, and it shall be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. And he shall slay the bull before Yahweh, and the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around in the slaughter place, which is at the door of the tent of appointment. And he shall skin the ascending offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the slaughter place and lay the wood in order on the fire. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall arrange the pieces with the head and fat on the wood, which is on the fire on the slaughter place. But its entrails and its legs he washes with water. And the priest shall burn all of it on the slaughter place as an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And if his offering is from the flock, from the sheep or from the goats, or an ascending offering, offering let him bring a male, a perfect one, or one without blemish. You know, not, not one that's all jacked up. And again, why? Because let's just think, you know, purely practically here. I'm running a, let's say I'm running a breeding program, okay, which they all were, right? You want to constantly improve your livestock bloodlines. So, using a male, a perfect one, yeah. See, this is also very practical because if you have too many males, they try and kill each other, right? You, you gotta band them, you know, make their make their their giblets fall off, right? So that's a thing. So it's it's practical to remove the the males from your herd, but it's also if you think about these sacrifices as far as them costing you something, it's the best that you're bringing. Okay, it's not your worst that you would cull from the herd anyway, that you would eat, right, or, or barter with or whatever. It's, these are the ones that you would keep. Um, and I know that in today's day and age, most people are not actively engaged in the art of agri agriculture, so this is maybe a little bit harder to understand, but we are here. I mean, from where I'm standing right now, I can see uh, chickens, turkeys, ducks, and sheep right here, and I can hear cows. So, um, I get it. I get it. This is not a sacrifice should cost you something. It, it shouldn't be something that you can just, if it just easily flows from your hand, that's not really a sacrifice, is it? It, it should hurt you a little bit. Um, which again, remember this is all done in, This is a facsimile of this. All of this points to, prophesies, foretells Messiah and the sacrifice of Messiah as the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice, his blood. So understand that when we're doing this, right? Like, Messiah met face to face with the Father and he was found perfect without blemish, right? Without sin. And he was slaughtered. And his blood was sprinkled on you. And it's that covering of blood. Why Passover? Why Passover? Why is Passover so much better than Easter? Well, A, because it's biblical, and B, because it's that covering of blood that has atoned for your sins and keeps you from the wages of your sin, which are death, keeps you from the slaughter that we all deserve, that I deserve because we're covered by that atoning sacrifice of Messiah, right? So all of this foretells that, prophesies that. Um, and when I slaughter a year old male sheep this year, it will be cheap. It will be a cheap facsimile of the atoning sacrifice of Messiah. And I'll be reminded constantly in the doing of that this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what Messiah did for me, that this couldn't possibly atone for my sins, right? We have a renewed covenant, Hebrews 8.8, 8, under Messiah, with Messiah being the mediator of Hebrews 8.6, and the our half of the bargain of that is that his laws, whose laws? His laws, not ours, not our opinions, not our pastor's opinions, not anybody else's bull crap, but his laws will be written on our heart, Hebrews 8.10. So, all this stuff still stands, and it, right now, in context, it stands for me as a reminder of just how cheap 
my worldly existence is compared to the depth of love that was shown upon that stake by Messiah. And that I can never, never even hope to match that. And so when people tell me, you know you don't have to do the Torah, I'm like, well, thanks for your opinion, but the Father says an everlasting covenant, so. But in the doing of, it's a constant reminder of, I'm not all that. I'm not all put together. I need a Messiah because I know where I'm falling short. The Christian church, the big C church will tell you, well, sin is just falling short of the mark, brother. What mark? If you don't know, you don't know. And ignorance is not bliss. So let me get off my, my soapbox here for a minute and continue reading. And he shall skin the ascending offering and cut it into its pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the slaughter place and lay the wood in order on the fire. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall arrange the pieces with its head and its fat on the wood, which is on the fire in the slaughter place. But its entrails and its legs he washes with water. And the priests shall burn all of it from the slaughter place. As an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And if his offering is from the flock, from the sheep, or from the goats, or is an ascending offering, let him bring a male, a perfect one. And he shall slay it on the north side of the slaughter place before Yahweh. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall sprinkle its blood on the slaughter place all around. And he shall cut it into its pieces with its head and its fat, and its priests shall arrange them on the wood, which is on the fire of the slaughter place, but the entrails and the legs he washes with water. And the priests shall bring it all and burn it all on the slaughter place. It is an ascending offering, an offering made by sweet by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And if the ascending offering of his offering is to Yahweh is of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. And you should go read about the cleansing of the temple for real. And if you struggle with the concept of a blonde haired, blue eyes, uh, wussified Jesus as your Messiah, go read the cleansing of the temple and understand that this man was a man. This man made a bull whip, drove people out of the temple, flipped tables over and was grabbing people by the neck in a righteous rage. I get asked this question all the time. Can anger be righteous? Man, it depends on how you apply it. People got thrown out by the skin of their neck for defiling his father's house. Remember that, for defiling his father's house. He wasn't at the local Pentecostal church. He was in the temple, that's number one. And number two, temples today are hell holes anyway because they are absolutely traditions and doctrines and dogmas of men not the word of the most high so we need to be careful both sides of this equation the judeo-christian values that founded this nation are extremely strong and have give us given us freedom and perpetuity yet we seem to abandon them when it comes to actually putting our nose in this book and reading them and so messiah when he cleansed the temple man he showed up hardcore. He wasn't, you know, hey brother, would you mind putting those dubs away? Why, why are you guys changing money? What's going on here? You know you shouldn't be doing that. Bring me some cordage, it's time to make a whip. Oh, I'm sorry, was that your table? Next. So, yeah, read up on that. And the priest shall bring it to the slaughter place and shall wring off its head and burn it on the slaughter place and its blood shall be drained out at the side of the slaughter place and he shall remove its crop with its feathers and throw it beside the slaughter place on the east side to the place of ashes and he shall split it at its wings but not sever it and the priest shall burn it on the slaughter place on the wood that is on the fire. It is an ascending offering, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. Now remember, this is the tent of appointment. They just got done building this thing. The Father is dwelling within their midst. Remember this, okay? And listen, the, the first line in this book, Warikra, is Yahweh called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of appointment. Like, here we go, visual aid. 
Man, I spelled decomp. There's something rotting and dying around here. The tent. The Holy of Holies. This is the tent of appointment. This is where they're washing with water. This is where they're doing the burnt offerings. So Yahweh called to Moshe from the tent of appointment and said, speak to the children of Israel, bro. So it wasn't like he was up here somewhere and he's like, yo, Moshe. And Moshe's like, yo, what's up, Yahweh? Like, they were right here, okay? So he is dwelling within their midst. He's there with them. So this, uh, a sweet fragrance unto Yahweh. There's been people, I don't know, people say lots of things. There's at least a, a, a notion out there in the interwebs that all of this was just a blood cult, like every other, you know, early religion. It's just a blood cult. Look at all the things that they slaughtered. Well, if we're going to go that route, which I completely disagree with, but if we were going to, I mean, what it was, uh, Tio Huacatuan or, you know, wherever it is in Mexico City, that, te that temple there, they slaughtered 80,000 people, people, on the day that they inaugurated that temple. 80,000 people. That's demonic. So if I got a choice between slaughtering a human being or slaughtering a sheep, I don't even have to answer that question. So it's not a blood cult, but if it was, if we were going to arrange it in the hierarchy of evil related to blood cults, it's pretty, you know, uh, I don't know, non-threatening, innocuous, like not a big deal. But that's not what's going on here. The father is dwelling within their midst. He's in, he's right there in the tent of appointment. He's like, this is how you do this. This is how you do this. Okay. <clears throat> and we're going to read, we're at the end of uh, Leviticus 1. We're going to read Leviticus 2. And then I'm going to read a little bit from this uh, messenger of, of uh, the name. Because there's some good outline there as far as the Levitical offerings in general. And that's going to give us some clarity here. Um, they've just done a good job of, of arranging it logically, which I'm big on logic and I'm big on simplicity. So rather than try and reinvent the wheel, I'm going to lean on them and I would encourage you to, uh, you know, check out their website. Shout out to them. So Leviticus 2, when anyone brings a grain offering to Yahweh, his offering is to be a fine flour and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. And he shall bring it to the sons of Aaron, the priest, and he shall take it from his hand filled with fine flour and oil with all the frankincense. And the priest shall burn it as a remembrance portion on the slaughter place, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And the rest of the grain offering is for Aaron and his sons, most set apart of the offerings to Yahweh by fire. Meaning they're going to burn a portion of this, and the, this grain offering, the rest of this is like, and this can manifest itself in different ways. It, like, it can be flour, it can be bread, it can be matzah, it can be fried bread, which is yummy. Um, right, so they burn a portion of it upon the altar, and the remainder of it is for feeding its provision for the priests. Okay. And the rest of the grain offering is for Aaron his sons, most set apart of the offerings to Yahweh by fire. And when you bring as an offering a grain offering baked in the oven... It is of unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened thin cakes anointed with oil. But if your offering is a grain offering on the griddle, mmm, pancakes, it is of fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. Divide it into bits and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. And if your offering is a grain offering in a stewing pot, it is made of fine flour with oil. Like, that'd be like fried in a pot. It's a stewing pot, but stewing flour is making glue. So I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't know if there's a Levitical glue offering or they knew something about stewing flour that I don't, but yeah. And you shall bring to Yahweh the grain offering that is made of these and shall present it to the priest and he shall bring it to the slaughter place. And the priest shall take from the grain offering a remembrance portion and burn it on the slaughter place, an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And the rest of the grain offering is for Aaron and his sons, most set apart of the offerings to Yahweh made by fire. 
No grain offering which you bring to Yahweh is made with leaven, for you do not burn any leaven or any honey in an offering to Yahweh made by fire. So we have uh, Passover, and then we have uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread coming as well, where you go and you remove all the leaven from your household. And that is symbolic of, again, you know, talking about the Exodus, which we just got done in Exodus. The beginning of Exodus, when they had to go, it's time to go right now, go, right? And so it talks about Passover, where you're gonna eat this lamb with your, your uh, loins girdled, you're ready to go, your staff in your hand, and you eat it all, and whatever you don't eat, you burn it in the fire, you don't take it with you, because we're going. Like, you eat it in one sitting, but you're not even sitting like like you got your staff in one hand and you got like a lamb leg in the other and all right go go it's the exodus go right and so <laughs> i could just like hebrew ground unit tactics move chayim chayim go go yori get online yori yori <laughs> so yeah so that's one thing. And then the other thing is the Passover is like, uh, that's the Passover and then unleavened bread. They didn't have time for their flour to leaven. And so this is a remembrance thing that we do, right? Their, their bread is basically sourdough bread, right? With wild yeast. Well, they had to, they had to go. They had to go. And so leaven then becomes a, uh, you know, symbolic of sin. And so in remembrance, we do these things, you know, and, and people scoff at the idea of doing things in remembrance, yet I would remind you that the doctrines and dogmas of the Big C Church has you participating in pagan rituals like Christmas and Easter for the extreme and only purpose of remembrance, misguided remembrance, but remembrance, that's what it's for. And it's storytelling, and it's storytelling because there's an innate part of our soul that resonates with stories. We're all storytellers and we're all listeners, right? So it's, it's the repetition of that story over centuries that gives it power, which is one of the myriad reasons that this book is so powerful because it's the repetition of these stories over millennia that gives it power and gives it authority. So you do this in remembrance of, right? Like that's like saying, well, you know, drinking the wine and eating the bread has no power. Well, it's like, yeah, cause it's just wine and bread. And regardless of whether or not you believe in, what's that transubstantiation, uh, big word. Thank you, Catholic church, question mark. Um, it's the remembrance of, it's the feelings that that evokes that gives it power. And so, yeah, you do Passover in remembrance of when the father passed you over and didn't slaughter you and you were covered by the blood of the lamb and he removed you from your bondage and your slavery. Wow, who does this sound like? Yeshua Messiah. And you do the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it reminds you to get the sin out, remove it from your household, get rid of it. Just be mindful of that. Shake up your daily order of operations, right? You don't eat leavened bread. You get it, you can't, it's gone, right? You're chowing on matzah for a week. Like, dude, no pizza, no bread, <laughs> like no pancakes, no, no nothing, man. No tortillas, yeah, it's matzah, okay. And while you're eating that matzah for a week, which by the way, matzah with crunchy peanut butter on it, score. Or honey, yeah. But you're being mindful of, you're changing the way you do things for a week in remembrance of. So, okay. Mm, -da -ba -da. 12, 212. Bring them to Yahweh as an offering of the first fruits, but they are not burned on the slaughter place for a sweet fragrance. And season with salt every offering of your grain offering, and do not allow the salt of the covenant of your Elohim to be lacking in your grain offering. You better season that grain offering. With all your offerings, you bring salt. And if you bring a grain offering of your first fruits to Yahweh, again, uh, agriculturally speaking here, your first fruits, literally the first things that are growing up out of the ground this season. Okay. 
And if you bring a grain offering of your first fruits to Yahweh, bring for the grain offering of your first fruits green heads of green roast of grain roasted on the fire, crushed heads of new grain. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall burn the rem remembrance portion from its crushed grain and from its oil with all the frankincense an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Okay, so that's Leviticus 1 and 2. I'm sure some, most of us are like, WTF, this doesn't make sense. We're going to get some things and burn some things. Like, what? And this is... Not necessarily easy to follow along with. And... Yeah. Well, that was all nailed to the cross. Show me the passage, please. Please show me. Because in my Bible, it says you will do this for all of your generations. If you love me, keep my commandments. Not one jot or one tittle will pass away from this. It says Messiah. Not says Pastor Bob over here at the local conservative Baptist church. It says Messiah. And for me... As a Christian, I am trying to be Christ-like to the best of my ability and to be a righteous man, which literally means to do all that God commands me to do, commands me to do. And if I'm looking for what those commandments are, I got to read what Messiah tells me to do and what the Father tells me to do. And remember in context that Yeshua himself says, I and the Father are one. Okay, cool. So that's what I'm doing. All right, so I'm going to read a little bit from Messenger of the Name uh, from their website. There's some background on Leviticus here. All right, so uh, they start off with, they say, uh, Waikra. This section of Torah is called Waikra, meaning, and he called. Uh, comes from the phrase, Waikra literally means to proclaim, pronounce, announce, or preach. Waikra is the name of this entire book, which has been called Leviticus, which means pertaining to the Levites. This Torah portion begins with Yahuwah speaking to Moshe in the tent of meeting concerning the korbanot, which are animals and meal offerings. The korbanot were essential aspects, aspects of the mishkan, or dwelling place. Yahuwah led his people out of Mitzrayim with a mighty right hand, and now the Eternal One himself is going to dwell in the midst of his chosen people. The key to bringing Yahuwah's presence in the midst of a people who are stiff-necked and who fall short of perfection is this system, this sacrificial system. Yahuwah requires clean animals for sacrifice. He specifies only oxen, sheep, goats, pigeons, and doves are acceptable for offerings. Okay, so there's a little clarification there, which again, I think was concise and well-written, which is why I'm doing this. And then we have the Ha'ola, or the ascending offering. Okay, the Ha'ola, or the ascending offering, is a free will slaughter offering, or a Nedababa. Nedaba. Nedaba? We'll just go with a free will slaughter offering. That means given freely. This offering was to be entirely burned with fire upon the altar of sacrifice. Like all offerings unto Yahuwah, the animal must be perfect without any type of defects. When the animal is sacrificed, the blood is to be caught in a pan, and the Kohen, or priest, sprinkles the blood on the altar, which is the Zerakat Chadam. If the animal is an oxen, sheep, or goat, which is the laying, or goat, Samicha, which is the laying on of hands, and Vidui, which is confession, must be done. So if it's an auction sheep or goat, you got to lay your hand on it and confess your sin. Then the animal is to be butchered into pieces, salted, and burned completely. And that's in Leviticus 1.3. We just saw that. We just read that. And then we have over here. The process is the same if the offering is of the flock from the sheep or goats. The animal must be male and without defect. Okay, so that's the animals, like right? we talked about that, the burnt offering, and that's kind of a free will confession of sin, here's my animal, let's do the thing. Okay, there's little bugs out here, they're attacking me mercilessly. Why? Okay, and then we have the ha min sha, or the ha min ha. The ha min ha literally means the gift, 
but refers to the meal offering, which is a free will gift or a nedaba, free will gift. This offering is of fine flour offered with olive oil and frankincense. Those who cannot afford to bring an animal normally give this offering. A portion of this offering is to be salted and burned on the altar. After Yahuwah receives his portion, the Kohanim, or priests, eat the remaining portion. This flour offering must be done quick enough that the dough will not rise. There are five varieties of the free will meal offering. The standard meal offering of fine flour, just flour. The baked meal offering, which were either loaves or matzah, flat unleavened bread. The pan fried meal offering, or the deep fried meal offering done in a pot. <coughs> so that's cool. Then we have the minchat bachurim, bachirim, the minchat bikarim, the minchat bachurim, question mark, the gift of first, first fruits, which is also called the ha omer, omer, ha omer. This specific offering happens the morrow after the weekly Shabbat, the day after the weekly Shabbat, which transpires during Passover and unleavened bread. Mm -hmm. The gift must be of the abib or aviv, green, sometimes yellowish, tender heads that can be parched barley, the new, uh, new barley, the first of the harvest in each year. In this, the kernels are roasted by fire before they ground into flour. Meal offerings always accompanied animal sacrifice. Okay, so that's good to know. If you're bringing an animal, you gotta bring some flour with you, maybe some you know, unleavened pancakes or something. And then we have the, the Ha Shalamim, or the Shalom Peace Offering. The Shalom Offering is a free will offering. The laying on of hands is to be performed for this offering, although confession is replaced with a verbal praise offering unto Yahweh, meaning like this is an offering of praise. The blood of the animal is to be sprinkled on the altar. The one who brings the offering is to eat of the meat. However, the Kohanim priest would eat of the breast and the right thigh. If the shalom offering is a sheep, the whole fat tail up to the backbone was included as a burnt, burnt offering. Then we have the hashatat, the sin offering, which is this, the hashatat, which is the sin offering, is not optional, but is a chova, meaning required. The offering is necessary to make atonement for individuals or the entire nation when they have accidentally broken the commands of Yahuwah. Different offerings may be required depending upon the position of one who has transgressed, as an example, Leviticus 4.3, referring to anointed priests. Um, or a similar offering is also brought in the case of the entire community uh, commits a transgression as a result of an erroneous ruling by the Sanhedrin, or high court, which would be Leviticus 4.13. Both the high priest sin offering and that of the congregation is to be a male bull that is offered by the Kohen HaKadal, the high priest, the blood of the offering was sprinkled inside the, Mid the Mikdash sanctuary on the golden altar opposite of the Peroche or veil. Instead of eating the meat, the skin and all its flesh with its head, legs, innards, and dung, the whole of it, was carried forth outside the camp to a clean place and burnt on the wood with fire. So, yeah. So that's the, the sin offering for the high priest, somebody in a high position, or the whole nation. So they, they slaughter that thing and cut it up inside, then they remove it outside. They get that sin outside and burn it outside the camp. So, and then we have the Ha Asham, or the guilt offering. And Asham is notable from the standard sin offering in that it requires a ram. And the animal's worth had to be at least two shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The asham of this Torah portion can be divided into three categories. The first type of trespass requiring a guilt offering is brought by one who inadvertently made use of a property belonging to the sanctuary. This crime is considered to be betrayal. Not only will sacrifice be required, but he must pay back what he had appropriated and add to that one-fifth of its value. The second category of guilt offering is asham talu, this offering is brought by one who thinks he may have unintentionally sinned, but is not sure. The third asham of our Torah portion is required when a man or woman has sworn falsely to deceive his neighbor for gain. 
Then lastly, it says the scriptures tell us that before these sacrifices were given, that Abel, Noah, Isaac, Abraham, Jacob, and Moses all pleased Yahuwah with sacrifice. All these sacrifices are very important as they have prophetic meaning. Meaning, literally, they point to the sufferings of Messiah. Approximately 40 years after Ye Yehoshua, or Yeshua, was killed, the house of Yahweh was torn from the ground by the Romans. Today, Yeshua is the only acceptable lamb of Yahweh. However, we must understand that the house of Yahweh will be rebuilt and the sacrifices shall continue according to various prophecies, especially in Ezekiel. So, there, if you want more or you want to look over that, just go to messenger of the name and then Vakira, and that's the Hebrew right there, uh, or Wakira. There we go. So, we're establishing here, yet again, the father is encouraging his kids, listen guys, this is how you're going to do these things, okay? Repeatedly, they don't do so good at doing the things, right? But he's here, they've built this temple, right? And we're talking again metaphorically now, they but for them, literally, they built their temple, we're building our temple, they're making sacrifices, we're making sacrifices, we're dying to ourselves daily, right, so we can be more like Messiah, not more like the world. These, these are the two paths, okay, more like Messiah, what he says to do, what the Father says to do, what we are encouraged and, and required to do repeatedly, over and over in this book, more like that or more like this broken, effed up world that we live in. Whenever the children of Israel get really out of line, remember, who are the children of Israel? Okay. Anybody that claims Messiah, you're grafted in. Hey, you know what? We're going to do this. We're outside. Let's go for a walk. Because we hear all the time about the wild branch, right? The Gentiles are grafted in. Good morning, Creek. I want you guys to see something. This series is called No Roots, No Fruit. This is a cedar tree. This is a branch. Okay? This branch, this wild branch, cannot exist without the trunk and the roots. Okay? It's not possible. That branch would die without its roots. That wild branch doesn't work without its roots. So yes, as Gentiles, we're the wild branch. We're grafted into the tree of life. But anybody who knows anything about agriculture knows that a branch is nothing without roots. It will die. It will die. And in fact, we see this in the New Testament. I believe it's in Acts. When they're like, hey, we've got all these Gentile believers in Messiah. What do we do? I said, send them to temple, right? They need to, here's the four things they need to do. They need to not eat anything that's been strangled. They need to not partake of the blood. They need to not fornicate because all three of these things were pagan worship or ways that pagans worshiped. And then they need to go to the temple on Shabbat and learn the Torah, these four things. This was the instruction for the wild branch. Not, oh, they believe in Messiah, they're good. Put some money in the plate. Those four things, okay? So don't worship pagan idols, don't perform yourself in such a way that a pagan would and go to the temple and learn the Torah so that you know what the battlefields on the line, what the lines on the battlefield of life look like so that you know whether you're crossing one, you're about to get out of bounds. If, are you moving forward or are you moving backwards, right? And this is, this is not me saying this, this is your Bible saying this, right? And that's why I encourage you to read your Bible, not to have your Bible read to you by somebody else, myself included. Read your Bible and pray to the Father that he would speak to you in languages that you can understand, that his truth would be indwelt in your heart, that his Ruach HaKodesh would live inside of you and that you would have clarity on all of this because it will revolutionize your life. And you start doing things the way that we're built to do, the way that we're intended to do. 
I, like, listen, this thing, not, none of this is permanent. This is not our home. We're all trying to get back home again. This, this small spark inside of us that's fearfully and wonderfully created in the image of the Most High is struggling mightily to get back home again. And nobody comes to the Father but through me, taught Messiah, right? And so if you're going to be a believer in Messiah, deeds not words, facta non verba. James said, my brothers, be not just a hearer of the word, but a doer also, meaning you got to take some action here. Yes, Messiah will get in and revolutionize your life and separate you from your sin as far as the East is from the West. And praise the Father that that's the fact, because you are not built to carry that burden. Okay, so you need redemption. You do. You need to get patched up. You need to get pointed back in the right direction, back to the Father, back to his ways. And then what? And then you stagnate and die. You plateau because of the modern Christian church. Because you don't take any further action. Action is what's missing. And action, in my humble belief, is that you should wake up every day, humble yourself before the creator of the universe, and thank him for salvation, and give to him all the burdens that you're carrying so that you're not worried about anything, you're just concerned you should read this word every day to the best of your ability and pray for clarity on it. You should seek his face at all times, whether you have a praise or you have a worry or something's hurting you emotionally or physically, all the time seek his face and talk to him like you would talk to a friend. And then you should go out into the world and you should preach the gospel with your actions, not just your words. So yeah, is all this sacrificial stuff in Leviticus, does it make sense? Yeah, it does if you have the proper context. And the concept that this has all been done away with is bull crap. Your pastor might say that. Your friends might say that. You could read a thousand articles on the internet that might say that. But if you're a Christian, you should look at what Messiah said and what he said was ain't none of this going away till heaven and earth passes away. And it's from where I'm standing, it's here and we're here. Now what?